It is good to see everyone here today and to be with you. This has been uh, such a great week for me personally to get to know so many of you and spend time with you. Uh, and just remember, this is a class, so if I mean to say fly fishing and I say deep sea fishing again, just wave me down, you know, say, I don't think there are any oceans in Montana, and we'll go from there. Uh, but I was thinking about uh, my, my parents are leaving on uh, Thursday to go on a, a mission trip to Ukraine. My dad's going to be teaching uh, there in, in Kiev, and they've done a lot of traveling lately. My mom just retired from teaching for 30 years, teaching second grade. And so one of the things they did this past summer uh, was something they had never really done before, which is they took a big trip for their anniversary. So it was the anniversary and my mom was retiring, so they went to Hawaii. And so they really enjoyed being there at uh, Hawaii and they started off in, in Honolulu and they went and worshiped with the church there on Sunday morning. And there were obviously people from different places that are all uh, there and one of uh, the individuals that was talking to them afterward what they found out was going to be the one who preached there he's a preacher so he was talking to them and uh, he asked dad where they were from uh, and dad said well we're from the uh, Memphis area the Germantown Church of Christ and he hadn't yet told him that he preached for the Germantown Church of Christ and so the guy said you know Germantown Church of Christ that sounds familiar I, there was a there was someone who preached there this was like, I mean, this is like, like a famous preacher. He's like a big name preacher uh, that preached there. Oh man, what was his name? I mean, he was really well known. And dad said, well, I don't know who you're talking about. You know, I've preached there for 28 years now. And he said, what's your name? And he said, Dave Phillips. He said, no, that's not it. Uh, let me know. And I just thought, you know, that's, that's great. If there's one thing you learn about leadership, it's not to take yourself too seriously. And dad just died laughing, you know, and the guy didn't even catch it. Well, he meant the one who was there before dad who had written a book that he had used and all this, uh, this other stuff. But it was funny to hear dad tell me that story. You know, one thing you learn about uh, Nehemiah, about really any leader in the Bible, is something Nehemiah keeps pointing to, and that is God's the one doing the work. That it's not about him. It's not about his name or who he is. Uh, and I love the way that we see that. I especially love how that's reflected when we get to chapter 3. We talked about Nehemiah preparing. We talked about him in the throne room asking for just a few years off and just a, some letters that make me kind of like an ambassador to this area and some of the king's timber. I mean, he had some big requests. God was with him. Those requests were granted. He goes to Jerusalem. And what he's able to do is really incredible. Uh, he in the end of chapter two is saying, let's arise and, and, and build, let's do this. And chapter three is one of those chapters that I think is easy to overlook. Uh, it's kind of like um, looking at a list that you would see at the end of one of the epistles, a list of names. Uh, and if you don't know who those people are, uh, maybe it's hard to really identify with it. Uh, in Columbia, where, uh, where I live, one of the funeral homes, really the oldest funeral home in town, uh, one of the workers there discovered that Central High School uh, in Columbia was, was throwing away a lot of these composites of their graduating classes uh, that they'd had from the you know, 40s and 50s and 60s. And they were trying to make room for them. They didn't have anywhere to put them. And so someone found out they were throwing them away. So the funeral home asked if they could take them. And so when you walk through one of the hallways in the funeral home, you have all of these composites of previous classes at Central High School. And it's really interesting because my first few trips in there, I kind of looked up and glanced at them. And I, I thought, well, that's neat. You know, that's kind of interesting and walked by. But in the seven years that I've lived there, I have had so many conversations coming in and out of the funeral home with members from Gramey or people I know from town that are standing and looking at their graduating class. And we can understand that, right? Because if it were our graduating class, we'd be very interested in that. I walked by them just as names that were on a wall, but they looked at them as people they knew and they'd tell me stories. And I've had conversations in that funeral home that we couldn't have had anywhere else because you have people thinking about their past and, and, and reliving some of those old memories. It's really powerful. And so what we have when we have this list of names, and we won't read them all, I would encourage you to, to look through there. Some of these names are different than the ones we're used to saying. I just want us to remember that these were real people that had sort of put their life on hold for this uh, working project. 
uh, and for what they were doing. And so as we go and we read this, you'll notice uh, starting, we'll pick up in verse 2 of chapter 3, uh, there's this phrase that keeps showing up. So verse 2 says, Next to him the men of Jericho built, and next to them Zachar the son of Emery built. Now the sons of Hisanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Next to them, Merimoth the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, made repairs. And next to him, Meshulam the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezebel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok the son of Bana, also made repairs. And at this point, you're probably glad that we didn't assign this as a scripture reading for one of the men to read on Sunday morning because there are a lot of names in here. But did you notice that, that phrase, next to him? And next to him, so-and-so was doing And here was the job so-and-so had. And next to him, so-and-so did this. So I want to try something just to kind of get us going a little bit today. Uh, and I, I want to think specifically about this congregation. So I want you to kind of inform me. I want to get a list. This doesn't have to be an exhaustive list. But I just want to get a list of some of the things, some of the ministries that this congregation does throughout the year. So just, just kind of as you think of them, you can raise your hand or throw them out there. And what I'd like for us to do is make a list and make kind of our own Nehemiah chapter 3. So we can sort of set out who is, is doing this. And we don't need necessarily names of who does what, but just the names of the ministries. And I know there's a lot that you all do, but what are the things? Lads to leaders, okay? All right, that's a very good one. Prison, what else? Prison ministry. prison ministry. All right. Casa. Casa is Christians Against Substance Abuse. Christians Against Substance Abuse. Oh, wow. That's very good. Is it deaf ministry? Deaf ministry? Youth. Youth ministry and what? The youth campaign is part of that? Absolutely. That's awesome. You go to Belize for a missions campaign every year? And then uh, trunk or treat? All right. Yeah. School supply. I'm not sure it's a ministry to say, but our church picnic is a highlight of our fellowship activities. Yeah. Cards for, cards for shut-ins, our church picnic. Yeah, take meals to shut-ins as well. Uh, on meals on Tuesdays. VBS. Tuesdays, Thursdays. VBS. All right. CIA. CIA. Christians, Christians in Action. All right. I mean, I'm thankful for the CIA too, I guess, but I... <laughs> I'm glad to know this was specific. I knew it stood for something. <laughs> Ohio State Fan Club. Now, wait a minute. Now, listen, my, my father was born in Detroit. We grew up uh, cheering Go Blue, so I don't know if I can include that one. It might be rough. <laughs> one, there's one member in the fan club? Okay. That's good. Greeters? That is so important. That's the first impression. People get. We have uh, monthly men's devotionals and women's devotionals. Okay. So men's and women's devotionals. Senior banquet. Senior banquet. Connection groups. Connection groups. Connection groups. All right. And men's prayer breakfast. Prayer breakfast, and then what was? Golden egg. Golden egg. Okay, is that the? Oh, that's neat. And that's called Ladies Time Out? That's awesome. All right. Yeah. Fruit baskets. Fruit baskets? Packages to the military. Military packages, and then what was one in the back? Men and Women's Retreat. Gotcha. Gotcha. Two separate ones. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, this... The what? Montana fly fishing? Yeah. I'll never live that one down. Oh, boy. 
All right, that's okay though. That's just checking to see if you were paying attention. That's all that was. If I were thinking quick, I could have thought of that. Okay, so uh, here's what I'd like for us just to think about. I want you to, maybe, maybe it's been a while since you've thought about all the different ministries that this congregation is involved in. But if you were to describe kind of your own Nehemiah 3 for the Deerfoot congregation, uh, you would be able to think about what was happening here throughout the year. And you would say, well, there's a group of people that get together and train our children for lads to leaders every year and go, I believe you all go to Memphis to the convention there. And, and uh, not only are they going there, but they're also getting that training constantly. And next to them, there are people who are working hard in prison ministry, reaching out to those who are desperately in need. And next to them, there are people working with Christians against substance abuse, helping people turn from addiction to see uh, who the true Lord is. And next to them, there are those reaching the deaf in the deaf ministry. And next to them, there are workers in the youth ministry leading things like the youth mission campaign. And next to them, you have people who every year go to Belize for a mission trip. And next to them, you have people organizing trunk or treat to reach out to not only children here, but I'm sure people in the community. And next to them, Pizza with Santa doing much the same thing. And next to them, we have people collecting school supplies. I think over a hundred, how many were given away? A hundred and 130 uh, plus uh, school supply packets were given away on Saturday. And next to them, you have people writing cards for shut-ins. And next to them, people taking meals on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And next to them, people organizing a church picnic for fellowship. And next to them, people who are putting together a vacation Bible school. And next to them, the Christians in action. And next to them, the greeters making a good first impression. Next to them, men's and women's devos. Next to them, those doing senior banquet. You could go on and on. And the connection groups and prayer breakfasts and the ladies' time out and the fruit baskets for shut-ins and the men's retreat and the military packages for military and the women's retreats and going to Camp Maywood. You could make quite a list and you could probably fill in the names of the people who were involved. And if you had your own kind of Deerfoot chapter three here of Nehemiah, you could see how many people are involved in making this congregation and ministry possible. I think that's encouraging. I think that's what we're getting with Nehemiah chapter 3. That even though it's named Nehemiah, it's not just about him. It's about all of these people uh, who put together uh, the work of the wall. And so it's in that context that we get to chapter 4. And chapter 4 is where we'll spend most of our time. Chapter 4 and 6, because there's some commonalities there. But chapter 4, you begin by people ridiculing the work of Nehemiah. Uh, you may have heard the story of this 2009 high school graduate, Khadija Williams. The reason her story got reported uh, among several newspapers and news outlets is because she lived with her mother, who had a lot of challenges, a lot of problems. They moved around a lot. Uh, she attended 12 schools in 12 years. Uh, half, she took half of fourth grade. She made it through half of fifth grade. Uh, she made it through seventh grade in two different cities and went to eighth grade for two weeks. Her mother struggled with homelessness and they were in and out of, of homeless shelters. But she decided when she got to high school that she knew that attendance mattered, that being at the same school and getting letters of recommendation mattered if she was going to get into college. And so uh, as reporters discovered, she decided she was going to pick a, a school that she would go to no matter where they ended up living. And so she would take a bus, wake up at 4 a.m. to take a bus uh, to get to the school in Los Angeles. Uh, and you can imagine with the traffic and everything, how long that took. Often when she went through school and then after school tutoring and things, she wouldn't get back till 11 at night. She graduated from high school and was accepted to attend Harvard. And so it was a real success story. I mean, it was really incredible and encouraging. But one of the things she mentioned was how many times she would run into people who would be maybe staying at the, the shelter that she lived in for a long time. And she said they, she would get bullied. They would look down on her. They would say, you're not college bound. You know, you live on Skid Row. We know who you are. There's no way we can do this. And yet she persevered. It's an amazing story. And we're drawn to those because we all instinctively understand what discouragements can do. And so even if we're not going to face the kind of discouragement that Nehemiah and these workers faced, uh, we're going to deal with that if we're Christians. Uh, if we put ourselves out there to serve God, we are going to have people 
who will discourage us. That's just the way it works. Uh, you, can, you can have a car that's parked and it can be in perfect position when it's parked and it can be in perfect condition and everything will go well, but that's not what a car is designed to do. It's designed to get out of the parking spot. It's designed to take someone somewhere. And so as we think through Nehemiah chapter 4, we'll start reading in verse 1, but notice how the discouragement is going to come up. Now, it came about it that, that when Sanballat, and we mentioned him last uh, yesterday, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. He spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Then Tobiah the Ammonite was near him, and he said, Even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. So already Nehemiah is dealing with the air. Area leaders who remember we talked about in Ezra 4 yesterday, they had already gotten work in Jerusalem shut down once before when they sent word back to Artaxerxes and he issued that decree and stopped it. So now that Nehemiah is here, he's resuming the work and he hasn't asked the area leaders permission. He's just going in with this mission. Uh, you can sense maybe they're beginning to get a little nervous or maybe they're just enjoying the position of power they've had over that area for a while. But they start insulting him and you start seeing these specific statements they make. And I just want us to think through them. The first one is, what are these, what are those feeble Jews doing? What do they think that they could possibly accomplish? I want to read a couple of verses from 2 Kings 25, because they give us some insight into the Jews who were there uh, after Jerusalem had been burned and plundered by the Babylonians. Verse 11 says, then the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon and the rest of the people, uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. So when the Babylonians came in and they would take the best and the brightest, uh, 2 Kings 25 tells us that they left some of the poorest of the land to sort of be the vine dressers, be the plowmen. It, it didn't mean that they necessarily uh, were, were letting this, them have their freedom. I mean, they still had some control over what happened in Jerusalem. But they're letting these people who were sort of the bottom of the barrel on the societal ladder. Well, you can be there. You're, you're poor. You can be here and just take care of the land. Those are the people that are kind of the core of the remnant there in Jerusalem. And so then Zerubbabel comes back. Ezra tells us about Zerubbabel and Ezra's leadership and Nehemiah comes back. But you still have this sense that these were not the cream of the crop. And so you can imagine these area leaders saying, what do these feeble Jews think that they're doing? They've been here for so long. They can barely manage to take care of this land. What do they think they're going to accomplish? So what are these feeble Jews going to do? Are they going to restore it for themselves? They think they're going to restore Jerusalem to what it was. Uh, can they offer sacrifices? Now, this is kind of a loaded question because one of the things that the Babylonians would do when they would take over uh, an area, just like many conquering nations would do, is you would take the objects of worship that that nation practiced and you would take them and put them in your possession. It was like you were saying, we are more powerful than the God that you worship. And so when they come into uh, Jerusalem, they take the things in the temple. And when we read through Daniel, we find that out. You know, we find out that they've taken the, the gold from the, the temple. Uh, they've taken precious metals uh, and, uh, and vessels that were there, bronze pillars uh, that were carried off to Babylon. And so they're saying, do they think they can make sacrifices? We saw what happened to that temple. You know, it's former glory. It's not there. Do they think they're going to be able to offer sacrifices to this one God that they serve? And again, that would have been so different than a lot of the area uh, nations that serve many gods. Uh, can they finish in a day? Uh, in other words, this is so unlikely. They think they can just uh, whip up a, a wall here in a day. What's the plan? What are we going to do? There's no way this is going to happen. And I have to think that you've got a little bit of 
sometimes we don't think about sarcasm being in the Bible, but I think that these people were saying these things sarcastically. They think they can really do this. They were mocking them. And so not only are they pointing to the embarrassment of everything uh, that has happened to Jerusalem when they say, can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble? Do you think you can recover from uh, when they came in and conquered you? You remember that? You ever run into someone who likes to constantly bring up the most like embarrassing thing you've ever done? You know, that kind of thing. Like someone who goes through, well, what about the time this happened? Or you remember when you did this? We don't like being pointed out to, to parts of our life that are, that are hurt or are embarrassing. And he's pointing that out to the, remember when you got, you got taken over and pillaged and burned? You think you can recover from that? And so all of this is happening, but they don't stop there. Uh, they also plot an attack. So if you're in Nehemiah 4, if you look at verse 8, all of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. And so they've conspired. They're going to come together. Uh, verse 9, Nehemiah says, But we prayed to our God, and because of them we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus in Judah it was said, The strength of the burden bearers is failing. Yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them, kill them, and put a stop to the work. So now this has gone beyond just mocking them. They're desperate for them not to finish this project. So they're going to come in unseen, and they're going to sort of strike when nobody expects, so they can kill them and stop the work. So that's one sort of evidence of a plot that happens. Now, if you look over in chapter 6, we see another, maybe more detailed uh, evidence of a plot beginning in verse 1. Now, when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah, to Geshem the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies, and remember, those three are the ones that we were introduced to in chapter 2, so they keep showing up. Uh, when it was reported to them that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, then Sanballat and Geshep sent a message to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Shepherim in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. So they say, Nehemiah, why don't you come meet with us? And they don't want to talk and they don't want to have conversation. They're planning to harm him. And so Nehemiah sends messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? They sent messages to me four times in this manner, and I answered them in the same way. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me in the same manner a fifth time with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations. And Gashmu says, you and the Jews are planning to rebel. Therefore, you are rebuilding the wall and you are to be their king, according to these reports. So now they've stepped up the challenge. Now they're not just trying to draw them out. Now they say, well, now, wait a minute. We're hearing Everybody is saying, have you ever had someone say, hey, you know what everybody's saying, right? And sometimes that just means like one, you know, people are saying this. Well, who, what people? Is it just one or two people or more than that? So he's saying, you know, I heard that you're planning to start your own kingdom here. And that that's, and what does that open the door for? It opens the door for the same kind of response you saw in Ezra 4, where we'll, we'll tell Artaxerxes, we'll tell the king that you're trying to start your own kingdom and we'll get this thing stopped. And so there's a little bit of a threat there, too. It's almost as if they're saying, you better come talk to us and work this out, or we're going to tell the king. Uh, and he goes through and, uh, and gives more accusations in verse 7 that you've appointed prophets uh, to proclaim you a king. And so in verse 8, I sent a message to him saying, such things as you were saying have not been done, but you were inventing them in your own mind. For all of them were trying to frighten us thinking they will become discouraged with the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. And so he responds to that. He deals with that uh, challenge. Okay, you're making that up in your own mind, but they're not going to discourage us. As if that's not enough, then they decide they're going to make good on what they'd said in chapter 4. They're going to send some people to come in among them. So when he says in verse 10, when I entered the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined at home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you and they are coming to you at night. But I said, should a man like me flee? And could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived 
that surely God had not sent him, but he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired for this reason, that I might become frightened and act accordingly in sin, so they might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. So now they've hired someone to come in and to give him a message. They get an insider, Shemaiah, to come in and say, hey, we need to go in the temple and close the doors of the temple. And he says, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like something God would want me to do. It sounds like something else is at work here. So I illustrate all these things just to say it was more than just insults. They were actively trying to trap him. They were actively uh, trying to, to take this progress and to stop it. Now, Nehemiah, every time, is able to see, okay, he's so focused on his mission, he knows uh, how to respond. But I think it's worth stopping and asking the question if there are some 21st century equivalents to this. If we can see some of these same questions that crop up uh, in our own lives. Uh, so maybe instead of necessarily what are these feeble Jews doing, maybe we hear the message today as Christians, well, your mission is a mistake. You know, you're wasting a lot of time. What, what would people maybe think that Christians waste their time doing? What would maybe the, our culture look at and say, you know, that's just kind of a waste of time that you're doing this? What would be some things? Okay, worship. Spending all this time in worship. Sundays. and so You're even here on a Tuesday morning in the middle of the week. And you're just, boy, this, what a waste of time. Mission right. campaigns to other countries. Okay. Mission campaigns to other countries. It's not cheap to be able to buy a plane ticket to go to another country and to make those plans and get lodging and food and all of that. Boy, why would you, why would you spend all your money and time doing that? Or what? Some might say, y'all are going on vacation. Or yeah, so yeah. you're just paying for a vacation here. Yeah. Uh, and maybe there have probably been some mission trips that were more like that, but I don't know about you. The ones I've been on have not been much of a vacation. You know, you're working uh, the whole time and that's good. That's what you're supposed to be doing. But yeah, you have people that look at that and say, you know, what you're doing, the world is already moving uh, this direction. This, why would you waste your time on that? Yes, sir. Spending time in prisons. Okay. Spending time in prisons. Uh, thinking about reaching those who are there. Do you think they'll really be interested? Uh, and I know there, some of the most encouraging stories to me uh, in ministry that I've ever heard have come from people doing prison ministry and ministering to those who have been uh, in jail and uh, for different reasons. But some would say that would be a waste of time. And so maybe we hear that message. Or maybe instead of, are they going to restore it for themselves, we get the message, you are too weak to accomplish it. Do you think that God could ever use you? I, I think that's a message sometimes we send ourselves. Have you ever had a conversation with someone, you've invited them to, to church, and they said, you know, if I walked into that building, the roof would cave in on me because you just don't know what I've done. Uh, and I, I hear that. I've heard that more than once. I think we can be pretty hard on ourselves, and we could think, you know, there's really no way that God could ever use me. That shame enters into the picture, and it changes our entire perspective. So maybe that's a message we get from the culture around us. Or can they offer sacrifices? Maybe we get the message, you know, this relationship with God is really not going to help you. You think this is going to help you make it through a situation. No, you've got, to, you've got to fend for yourself. You've got to take matters into your own hands. You know, there's no need to just trust in God through all this. That's not going to accomplish anything. Or maybe this one, you will never meet that goal. You'll, you'll never be able to do this. Uh, if, have you ever had a conversation with someone who, uh, who told you that? Who, if you were, you were trying to do something with your life and they said, you know, I, just, I really don't think you ought to do that. Uh, I, just, I don't think that'll ever happen. I don't think you'll ever, you'll ever make that. I don't think that person's ever going to become a Christian. There's not much hope for you talking with him. There's not much hope for you inviting her to church. I've known that person. They're not going to change. You know, you will never meet that goal. Uh, I often think when someone describes a person who says, hey, I've known that person a long time. He's never going to become a Christian. I always have to think about the Apostle Paul. Because if you did a poll in Jerusalem Christians uh, and during the time Stephen was stoned for the least likely people to become Christians, I have to say Paul would be somewhere on that list, right? Uh, Saul of Tarsus would be somewhere on that list. And yet he did 
become a Christian. So we never know. But anyway, some might say you'll never meet that goal. Uh, or you are beyond redemption. Uh, do you think you're ever going to be able to do that? Uh, more of that statement, if, you've only, if you only knew what I had done. Uh, and I always like to think about what Peter writes. I just want to read a couple of verses in 1 Peter 1, verse 18. He says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. It's a reminder to us that when redemption came, it didn't come with an amount of money that we could come up with. It didn't come with silver and gold. It came with, came with the precious blood of Christ. And what sin out there is so great that the blood of Christ can't redeem it if I'm going to serve him, if I'm going to repent of that sin and serve him? Well, is there any sin too great to be forgiven? I think passages like that are helpful for us uh, to remember that. And so we might hear some of these things. Uh, and as one uh, individual H.G. Uh, Wells said, the trouble with so many people is that the voice of their neighbors sounds louder in their ear than the voice of God. Now, you can look at H.G. Wells' life and you can, you know, point out different things that he did. I'm just saying that quote, I think, is, is very powerful. That the voice of our neighbors often sounds more loudly than the voice of God. Uh, and sometimes we need those moments uh, to look past what people are saying and to decide how we're going to respond. Andrew, yes. You mentioned about, you know, this is Tobiah and Sanballat. You know, they're the ones, they're the outsiders that are, are yeah. just, you know, putting them down. Recognizing the fact you brought chapter 3 and you brought in the works that we're doing in, next to each other. And mm -hmm. I've, never, I've never thought about that. I've never laid those out in looking at we're next to these things. I think sometimes because the people had a mind to work, they weren't the ones producing the persecution. It was yeah. outsiders. But when we don't lay our works together and realize that we're all working with each other together, sometimes we can become Sambalat and Tobias mm -hmm. and other works. And we yeah. can put, you know, we can be the ones that are doing those things and uh, realizing we're, we've got to all have a mind to work. And when we do that, realizing we're not the enemies, yeah. when it comes to that, it's the outsiders. But we're realizing if we have an inward focus, we're looking at, you know, maybe pointing out, like, hey, you didn't do that work very well. <laughs> you, you know, you, you know, examining each other's works. I think yeah. sometimes we can cre create our own persecution from within. And That's true. That Absolutely. Well, yeah, because you do have such a contrast between the people who are working hard and working together. And as Nehemiah said, they don't have time to get involved in all that other stuff. You know, he says, I don't I can't come down from doing, I'm doing too good a work. I can't engage with that. And there might, there might be times where maybe in your congregation or in other places that you're involved with, there are some outside forces that are overly critical and too harsh. And sometimes the best decision we can make is just to keep doing what we're doing and not engage. You know, now there are times you might have to, but I'm just saying I love Nehemiah's focus. He knows this isn't going to be productive, but what we're doing right now would be productive. And so I think that's... Uh, that's important. I wanted to share with, with this as we kind of make the turn and think about, okay, here are the challenges we face. Now, how are we going to respond? Uh, I've always liked this story, and you may have heard it before. It's a great illustration uh, by a Swedish businessman uh, who was reading in the paper about what he thought was going to be the obituary for his brother who had passed away in the East Indies. But they got the two brothers confused, and they put his name down there. And so they had done a report on... His, and his name was followed it. And he, and he was Alfred Nobel who invented dynamite. And so the names that were in this uh, obituary were dealer of destruction or peddler of death. You know, he had all these things that were connected with him uh, and dynamite and the work he'd done. And so he decided from then on, he didn't want his name associated with that. He wanted it associated with something else. And so when we have the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, we're thinking of someone who made a decision I wanted to live differently. So how are we going to respond uh, when we have those challenges come our way? Uh, the first thing that we see all through this is they respond in prayer. Uh, when Nehemiah dealt with enemies, he prayed that God would deal with enemies. This is such an important element uh, in, in Scripture. I think it's also an important element in some of the Psalms. Like if you read through the Psalms, 
there are so many times we're seeing the highs and lows of individuals in Psalms. And some of the Psalms that are often called um, imprecatory Psalms, where, where you have someone who's angry at his enemies, and he's praying that God would do something to his enemies, there's some harsh language there. It's tough. I think it's included in Scripture, so we can know that God's people have always struggled with this. But one thing that's characteristic of those is the psalmist is praying that God will take care of it, not that he can take care of it, not taking that into his own hands. It's like Paul would talk about in Romans chapter 12 about vengeance being the job of, of God. Uh, God says, uh, vengeance is mine, I will repay. That when, when Nehemiah is praying, he's not praying, uh, please you know, help me get an army together and to beat these people into submission. He's praying that God would take care of his enemies. And I think that's a tough attitude for us to have. But it's a mark of faith that we see all through Scripture. Now, I might tend to pray that God would take care of my enemies just exactly the way I'd like to see them taken care of. And uh, maybe I've got specifics for that. Uh, and perhaps that doesn't work out that way. But I love that he responded uh, with prayer. Uh, and so if I'm dealing with outside uh, influences and discouragement, uh, the first place to begin is in prayer. But also, you, you can't negate the, the aspect of hard work. That not only was he willing to pray about it, he wasn't just going to pray and then sit back and be passive. The people had a mind to work. They were working. Yes, there was a threat. Yes, there were enemies around them. Yes, they had to be ready you know, if they were attacked. But they were going to continue to work. Uh, that's also important, I think, in a culture where we tend to think of work uh, in a sense as uh, maybe something that's a necessary evil, but it's still not all that great. And maybe you've, you've probably had, had jobs that maybe felt that way. I understand that. But the concept of work, which is really interesting, work existed even in the Garden of Eden before sin entered into the world. They were still called to tend the garden to keep it. Their work was not a product of the fall of man. It was there. God had designed it for them. And so uh, when we think about being engaged in the work of the church, well, that's part of God's design for us to work together. And so constantly we see that, uh, that people put their lives on hold to do this work. Uh, so he was working and he also took thoughtful action. Uh, he thought before he responded. Uh, I believe it was last year at uh, Fried Hardeman's lectureships, but... Uh, Jim Gardner is one of the professors there, and I always enjoy listening to what he has to say about really any subject. But one of the things he mentioned was that when it came to anger, he said he had never done, and I'll, I'll paraphrasing this, he had never done anything in anger that he was proud of in retrospect. He said, I can't think of anything I did or said in anger that made me proud when I looked back on it. I thought that was pretty profound. I think I can relate to that. I can think of things I've said in anger, and I can feel that sense of shame, and boy, I wish I wouldn't have said that. That wasn't good. But there's thoughtful action uh, that needed to be taken. And so when they tried to draw him away uh, in chapter 6, it could have been really tempting for Nehemiah to say, you know what, I've had enough of these guys. I'm going to handle this. I'm going to go there. I'm going to meet with them. I'm going to tell them what I need to tell them. And I'm, you know, instead of doing that, he said, you know what? I'm, I'm working on something that's too great. I'm prioritizing God's work over something that might give me personal satisfaction. And so these three elements, I think, when we deal with discouragement, uh, can be really helpful. Am I responding with prayer? Am I responding with hard work, with thoughtful action? Uh, and I think along with that, it's important for us to hold up examples of ways these discouragements are not accurate. So, for example, if someone says, well, you can't make a difference, it's important for me to be able to rehearse in my mind ways that God has used my life, ways that God has used my congregation to make a difference. That's another thing the psalmists do. Uh, they will often, the psalmist will remind uh, himself of what God has done in the past and kind of rehearse that in the psalm. You delivered us from Egypt. You created the world. There's something important about reminding ourselves of what God has done. Uh, one of those things came to mind this week. I guess it was yesterday uh, when I read an update. I, I mentioned that we have a congregation uh, that we support in the Phoenix area. 
the Salt River Church of Christ, and it primarily is ministering to those who live on a nearby reservation. Uh, but they started about, I guess, about five years ago. Uh, and now they'll have, you know, 80 or 90 that come together and worship, and they've had a lot of baptisms. Uh, but one of the workers there who grew up on the reservation himself and uh, has a pretty amazing story and went to school uh, at Bear Valley and came back to work with him, uh, he was informed of a group of people that were deep into uh, Navajo territory in a reservation six hours away. And this man just said he heard there was a group of people there who were meeting together and studying the Bible, but that's all that he knew, really. And so they got up early one morning and headed out from Phoenix, made the six-hour drive to get there by lunchtime. And they met with a group of Christians that somewhere, someone somewhere along the way had taught the gospel They'd been studying the Bible. They didn't have a, a preacher. They didn't have really any connection with an outside uh, church or a congregation. But they would meet together on Sundays. They would study the Bible together. They would worship together. Uh, many of them had been baptized. They were seeking to do just what we call people to do, which is practice first century Christianity, practice the kind of Christianity we see in the New Testament. Uh, that, was, that was what they were doing. And he he posted just how amazed he was by seeing all that they had learned and how eager they were when they found out he would come in and he would, he'd talk to them about the Bible. And he stood up and spoke. And he said it was, um, they were just thrilled that someone had come to this small group of about 10 or 11 people that were meeting together on Sundays and worshiping because they were just trying to do what the Bible said. Uh, and sometimes we feel like, well, just preaching the Bible isn't really going to make much of a difference. Well, it did for a group of people we don't even know about, which also makes me think there's a pretty good chance there are other people in other places that I don't know anything about that are looking at God's word, that are doing what it says, that are glorifying him. And just because I don't know about it, uh, just because the people who might discourage me are thinking, well, you know, we don't we don't think it's very effective just to preach the Bible anymore. Just because I don't know about it doesn't mean it's not there. And I think that's really powerful. Uh, and Nehemiah is able to look with his vision, and even in the midst of discouragement, he's able to make this happen. God uses him in a powerful way. And so I wanted just as, uh, and I know we've got just a few more minutes left, but I thought it would be good for us uh, to think specifically about ways that we can be discouraged today. We've used some examples, but as Christians, what are some discouraging things that we see and how can we use this response to address those discouraging issues? So let's start with a common discouragement. And then what are some things we can pray for? What are some things we can do? And what thoughtful action should we take to deal with them? So let's start with one way that which Christians can be discouraged. What can be discouraging for us? Okay, criticism. Let's think, what kind, what kind of criticism might people make of the church, of Christians? Okay, you're so concerned with salvation that you, you, know, you think everybody else is wrong. And with that, the assumption is that you don't care about other people, which is obviously not true, but that's kind of the assumption that comes with that. So maybe there's some unfair descriptions that are applied to the church. All right, so how can we respond to that? What are some things I can pray for if I hear that kind of thrown my way? Opportunities for an outward focus. Okay. Opportunities to reach out. Opportunities to reach out to prove that I care. If someone thinks, well, you Christians don't care about anybody else, maybe an opportunity to, to show that I care. What might be something else to pray for? Maybe I could pray that I, I would have an attitude that reflected love for other people. You know, maybe praying that God would help me not to have an attitude where if someone hears that, they could say, well, I don't know. I know a Christian. I know a member of the church that doesn't think that, that doesn't act as if he doesn't care about me, that is focused on what's important. I think praying that we don't allow that criticism, that mentality, whatever they throw at us to not stick mm -hmm. in our own mind. Yeah. Yeah, praying that we don't allow criticism uh, to, to stick in our own thoughts and our own minds. And also, kind of the flip side of that, praying that we don't allow criticism like that to cause us not to teach the truth. Right. 
We still want to teach the truth, even if we do. So there are all kinds of things that we can have in our prayers. Now, what are some, some things we could do? What are actions we could take in the lives of others that would maybe, if that's become a barrier, that would maybe reach beyond that to them? What do you think? In the way when someone actually asks that, because I mean I know that I've been asked that specifically. Yeah. Point blank by so many people. Uh, I go immediately to Romans chapter ten and verse six, where the idea is, it says that righteousness based on faith says, "Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven." Mm-hmm. That is to bring Christ down. You know the answer there is it's not my place to even put someone in heaven, or who will descend to the abyss because that is to bring Christ up right. from the dead. It's not my place to put someone in the abyss. I don't have the power to bring Christ up from the dead. Well, righteousness based on faith says uh, the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. We have that. We look at what he's saying. What does the word say? And that, that levels the playing field. We're here to just follow what the Bible says. Yeah. Yeah, be ready for a response that takes, uh, that takes the onus off of us as some kind of judges and says, hey, God is, God's word is what we're about. That's right. Is important. I think one of my favorite responses to that was... Uh, uh, Jim Bill McIntyre years ago was on a Nashville TV program that was kind of famous for trying to corner uh, people with questions. And so someone asked him that. He said, you think the members of the Church of Christ are the only ones going to heaven? Uh, and he said, well, he said, tell you what, I think probably some of us aren't going to make it. <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter what building you're sitting in. It matters how you're living. And he kind of, but he, he sort of took the sting out of that question and said, here's what the point is. Not everybody sitting in a certain church building is going to go because of that. It's because of what, of what we're doing. Yes? Um, the summer before I got married, someone from the church in a little town where we live told my mother-in-law she was going to hell. Mm-hmm. And it took me a long time yeah. to get that out of her mind. And I probably never did. But she never would discuss it with me. Mm-hmm. That's right. And that's all we can do. But praying for that, connecting that with hard work. What are some things I can do to show love? Even if someone doesn't agree with me, I'm still called to love them and to show that kind of love to them and thoughtful action. So am I ready to have a thoughtful response? Uh, And you mentioned that give an answer to everyone uh, who asks. And Peter also includes in that uh, with gentleness and reverence. Did I do that in a way that's gentle and with reverence? What else? You have to be an example. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, Tim. I don't know who said it. I've always liked this response to that. Uh, but asked, do you think the only one's going to heaven? He said, I believe just like you do. I believe that everybody's been raised in order to be saved. Everybody should be in order to be lost. Mm-hmm. It's clear that the Bible teaches it. And the majority of people are going to be here and there. Yeah, that's hard to argue with, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's, you're exactly right. It's, it's hard to argue with that. But if we think about it, uh, we, we have our, our prayer, that we think about how we can, what we can do, how we can respond. Uh, that, I think, is so important because chances are, if we haven't prepared for that question, we haven't thought about it, and someone says that, it, it can just become sort of like a, you know, uh, kind of a you d- yes, you do, and no, you don't, are not, are too, are, you know, that kind of thing back and forth without really thinking through what the scripture says. Yes. Yeah, and and that's true. And that's a great response because that opens up a dialogue. So now you're listening to them. Now you're hearing them, and you have a chance to show that kind of thoughtful response. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Slow to speak and quick to listen. It's very important. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that someone had said to him, well, 
people maybe will be surprised when you get to heaven. There will probably be some Baptists there. And he said, no, I won't be surprised because there won't be any. And yeah. so maybe the reason people have this perception of us is because some people genuinely believe it. And some of the hard work we have to do is internal. It's not just about how people perceive us, but also about the things that we're saying and teaching and working to see what, like he said, why are we perceived that way? Yeah. What things are being said? What's the impression we're giving off? So a lot of the work is actually internal, not just external. That's working on ourselves is very important. And I love Tim's uh, response to that is to just say, hey, those who obey God are the ones who are going to be saved. Those who don't, are what? you can't get much more, much simpler than that. I want to stick with God's word, don't you? You know, boy, I just want to do what God says, don't you? And just kind of coming back to that. So that's good. Let's, let's do another one. Let's do another, uh, what's another discouraging thing that people might throw out about the church? Yes. Are you a liberal or are you a conservative church? Oh, boy. Aren't, the, aren't those conversations fun to have, too, you know? Uh, we, of course, we tend to define that on where we are, right? Who, who's ever to the right or the left of me? You know, that's kind of how we, how we determine that. So when we think about that, uh, what, should, what should our prayer be if you have different things going around from, um, from different angles? Maybe we could be praying that God would keep us right in His Word, that God would keep me in His Word that I would allow uh, my conscience to be formed by what's here and my actions to be formed by what's here. And maybe, maybe part of the hard work would mean uh, when, when we're doing something, whether it's as simple as what we do in worship or whether it's what we're doing in ministry, that I understand biblically why we're doing it. That I know that if someone were to say, well, why do you do that? Have you ever had, I've had these moments where someone says, why do you do that? And I've had to stop and say, well, that's... I kind of just grew up with that. That's a good question, you know? And so maybe it's worth, some of that hard work is understanding why we do what we do uh, so that we can do that. And then thoughtfully uh, sharing that with others. Andrew, Absolutely. I thought of a passage from Proverbs to, to, for that answer. Proverbs 4, 26. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn mm -hmm. your foot away from evil. And so, like you said, we are not... We are not the standard, therefore, to the right or left of us. Right. God's word is the standard. That's right, yeah. And we, so we've got to ponder the path of our feet. Am I walking in the path of yeah. truth and not going from the right or left of it? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, a great image uh, to have in our minds. And I can remember as uh, just right out of Fried Hardeman, uh, having a, a gentleman after I, I spoke somewhere, an older preacher that was... Um, I think probably in a couple of years later had passed away. He was an older, well-known preacher, and he, he kind of took me aside, and he gave me a pep talk afterwards. And I got the feeling I was one of many young preachers that he'd had this pep talk with. But he said that very same thing. He said, stick with the Word of God. Don't go to the right, to the left. Just keep going with Him. And I've always thought about just how there will always be a place. If we're teaching the truth, there'll always be a place we can serve. There'll always be something we can do if we're sticking with the Word of God. I think that's powerful. And so, yes, sir. Many times we disagree with someone about some religious matter. There are only three conditions that can exist. Either I'm right and you're wrong, uh -huh. or you're right and I'm wrong, or we're both wrong. So we can just sit down with one another and see what we can't compromise. That's true, yeah. Yeah, and I love that, uh, I love that idea of making sure, how are we going to settle this? We're going to sit down with God's word. We live in a world where we love to watch conflict and argument. Uh, like you can watch any, any ESPN show that's going to tell you about sports will be two people kind of arguing with each other. You know, should this team have done this? Should this team? But that's, that's subjective, right? They both have their opinions. And at the end, there's no real answer other than the one that you agree with. But when it comes to Bible study, we do have that objective. So sitting down and saying, all right, here are three options. Where are we going to settle it? If we just talk about it, well, that might be good. It might be a nice conversation, but we won't get any uh, solid closure. We won't get any conclusion. But if we use God's word uh, as our objective truth, uh, we can. So I think that's important. I, I hope that we've seen just today that uh, some of the strategies that we see here in Nehemiah can be helpful to us. And so I want you, number one, to be encouraged 
uh, by this list. And I'm sure there are things that happen probably every week that aren't on this list I jotted down. There may be things that happen in your congregation that not everybody knows about, that someone takes it on themselves to do. And that's awesome. There's a lot of work going on. When discouragement comes, how can we respond in prayer? How can we respond with hard work and thoughtful action? And so I want to kind of leave that with us. Tomorrow we're going to to conclude by thinking about what happens a couple of chapters later as the law is read, uh, what it means to be uh, the phrase uh, often used over the years has been people of the book. What does it mean uh, to be formed by the word of God and how does that change our lives? So that's where we're going tomorrow. Uh, but I appreciate our conversation and our discussion. Isn't it a blessing to be able to deal with issues that are kind of tough for us to work through, but to know we can do it together with God's word? Uh, something good will always come from that. So I appreciate you and I appreciate your comments today.